This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to re-watching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Katie White, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Chad Hopkins. But from much further away this time, Chad. Yeah, I'm a little sad being back in Texas. It's nice to be sleeping in my own bed after a week on air mattresses, <laughs> but uh, I definitely miss being around people I hadn't seen in a while, including you. But... You've celebrated a birthday since I'm then. Older so, and wiser. happy belated birthday. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How was it? It was nice. I had uh, my family come up, which it just sort of turned out that it happened to be over my birthday. They didn't plan it specifically for that, but um, both my, my parents and my sister were up. So, it was really nice to see them. The weather was perfect. It was cool in the 70s. We did a bunch of outdoor things. So, it ended up being really, really lovely. Um, and I got a week off work. So, even better. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, I'm glad. And I didn't plan it for your yeah. birthday week either. It, it, it's funny. I visited two people in New York and both of you celebrated your birthdays over this weekend. So yeah, uh, it's just funny how things happen, I guess. The rest of your trip was good? <laughs> it was. I uh, walked a lot in DC, which was basically my whole week. I think we walked upwards of 10 miles a day yeah. all week long. So I'm not used to being in a pedestrian city, but you're, that's old hat for you at this point. Yeah. It takes a little bit to get used to, but... Uh... Keeps you thin. <laughs> uh, lots yeah, of lots of exercise. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we get started, we do have new reviews on Apple Podcasts from PR27 and Kevin Westfall. For a brief moment in time, we had 69 reviews on iTunes, and uh, we, we tweeted it out. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> But something else uh, really crazy happened over the weekend, and I texted you about this, and we were both like, wait, what's happening? Yeah, we got um, as high as number 53 on the Apple Podcast TV film top podcast list, which is, like, really cool. So thanks, guys. Um, we really appreciate it. I mean, uh, thank you so much yeah. to our old and new listeners. Welcome, if this is your first time listening. Uh, we really are glad to have you. Which, unless you're really crazy fast at binge listening, our new listeners from this weekend probably won't be listening for another week no. or two to this one. But welcome all the same. <laughs> unless they just want to start in season five, yeah, which maybe, is totally fine. So. Um, you know? <laughs> but uh, we do encourage you to go start at season one and kind of rewatch as, as we have. Well, today we are covering parts one and two of Lecture Circuit. Part one aired on February 5th, 2009. Part two aired on February 12th, 2009. They were both written by Ken Quapis and written by Mindy Kaling. We will be discussing them as if they were one episode. Which, real quick aside before we get to the plot summary, I just realized uh, Stress Relief aired on February 1st, I think, right? Uh, which means that it aired out of its normal time slot. Because the Super Bowl is always on a Sunday, and The Office traditionally aired on Thursdays. So we had... They had two episodes of the Office in one week, which is pretty cool. In a week, yeah. They, they doubled up. Yeah, I just realized that while you were talking. So, Anyways, following the duel, when Michael talked to David about how the Scranton branch is doing so well, Michael has been asked to go on a lecture circuit to all the Dunder Mifflin branches, minus Nashua because of Holly, to share in his success. He presents at Utica more or less successfully, and Pam finds closure with the now pregnant Karen, leading Michael to seek out closure with Holly. He and Pam break from schedule to head up to Nashua so he can confront her and hopefully find closure for himself. Back at the office, Jim and Dwight have upset Kelly again, this time because they forgot her birthday, so they spend all day attempting to make amends with Kelly by throwing her a memorable birthday party. My first note for this episode was, David asked Michael to do a lecture circuit. Yeah. David <laughs> asked Michael, knowing Michael, I said, what? Why, how, and have they met? Yeah, we are of the same mind here. That was my f first note as well. I said, I, I have to criticize David a little bit here and ask why he thought Michael would be able to go on a successful, helpful lecture circuit after he wasn't able to articulate even a single modicum of how he's able to make Scranton Branch successfully. And we decided, or how he's not able to make the Scranton Branch successful, and they're just gifted on their own. Uh, it, it really is a strange choice, and I don't know... Considering what happens in this episode, if David could have expected any better. Right. David had uh, Michael in his office recently um, asking him, hey, what are you doing right, basically? And uh, Michael was not able to give him a straight answer. And I could see if Michael 
was able to give him a straight answer, how that would be reason to send him on a lecture circuit, because that whole purpose of the visit was no one else is doing as well as you. What's what are you doing? How can we replicate it? Right. And had he been able to explain um, how it could be replicated and what he's doing, then I could totally see uh, sending him on a lecture circuit. But there was no complete thought that came out of Michael's mouth. I mean, he just completely spilled nonsense the whole the whole visit. You know, I don't think this is actually the case, but it just occurred to me, what if David sends Michael on this lecture circuit so everybody else can see how incompetent he is, but his branch is still the most successful. And that's almost a sort of motivation for them. Like, wow, this guy is doing that well. We can definitely do better than that. I don't know. I, right. I kind of doubt it because David's <laughs> a nice guy, but maybe. <laughs> I don't think you want to humiliate Michael like that. No. Um, not that Michael would know he's be- being humiliated, but uh, it's, it's worth a thought. <laughs> Um, he, he asks Pam on the way as they're getting close, you know, are you nervous to see Karen? Because, you know, you were the other woman, although no actual infidelity happened. You, you could maybe argue that there was emotional infidelity on Jim's part uh, with Pam. I don't know. Uh, not really anything I think we need to get into. But he's basically creating drama where there really shouldn't be any uh, because that was two seasons or nearly two years ago. And it also occurred to me, maybe it's to create drama that covers up his his last visit to Utica back in Branch Wars when him and Dwight ended up pinning themselves to a wall with a copier. Yeah, uh, I don't think either of them is super keen to see Karen. Um, But when they get there, we kind of realize how much time has passed. I didn't think it had been that long, but Karen is now married and presumably eight months pregnant, as she is due in a month. So she is. She has moved on, mm-hmm. um, and and we see that physically and in her uh, reactions with Pam. And Michael cannot deal with a pregnant Karen. <laughs> he has so many questions. He says, is that Jim's? You're huge, which just never say that to anyone ever. Um, I'm trying to figure out the last time you and Jim had sex. And he says, so is there a guy or a person or a sperm machine that did this to you? <laughs> so... <laughs> He really doesn't know how to hold this conversation. And he asks her in the the conference room while he's giving his presentation, she raises her hand to ask a question about how relevant what he's doing is. And she says, he asks, oh, do you need to go out and pump? (laughs) She says, no, I won't have to do that until after I have the baby when there's something to give the milk to. Um, He's trying to figure out when they last had sex. And I just... Because he asked the question, I found an answer, more or less. Uh, We mentioned this timeline that's on Dunderpedia before, um, even though we weren't 100% confident in it. But the job when Karen and Jim broke up was supposedly in May 2007, and Lecture Circuit is February 2009, so around 21 months. So it's definitely been a very long time since Jim or Karen had any interaction with each other, even since Branch Wars, which was towards the beginning of season four. Right. And Michael, kind of under his breath, after he says, I'm trying to figure out the last time you and Jim had sex, he says, 10? 10 months? <laughs> Which can't even be... No. And even if it was 10 months ago, it wouldn't be that baby. No. Because <laughs> it takes nine months. So he's just wrong. How rare. His lecture is, you know, probably as expected, awful. He starts by lying to everyone about his father dying. He fabricates this phone conversation on a calculator. And he says, you know, they have to they have to sell an experience. But Karen just rightly calls him out as a liar. Uh, And then he does his mnemonic device that works like he's able to memorize everybody's names. But it's it's really insulting. He points out their undesirable traits like balding or moles or being overweight in the case of pepperoni Tony at the end of the episode or inappropriate things like sugar boobs or black woman or knocked up. I mean, kudos to him. It works. But I think the the path to it working should probably be kept in his head. Yeah. And then he asks the people in Utica to try it on each other. And they already know each other's names. They work with each other. And they point this out. And he says, I think it'll be worth trying anyway. That'll just make it easier for you. <laughs> it'll just make it easier for you. I'm okay. Like he's, I, I can't figure out what exactly this presentation is about. I don't even know what it was supposed to be about presumably how his branch is doing so well, but he does not cover that ever. He brings mini mounds bars. 
and uses that as proof as to why he's not a liar, which makes no sense. It's it's completely nonsensical. And this whole time, Michael's treating Pam like his hot magician's assistant or his roadie. He criticizes her conservative clothing. Uh, and he's also she's also being his pack mule and driver so he can focus. He's not doing any of the work himself. You see her struggling to lift things into the trunk and that doesn't fit. So let's put it in the back seat. And then as they pull up to Utica, she's carrying it all on her back and behind her. He is being absolutely useless as far as doing the work that goes into this and is instead making Pam do it. I guess she's not complaining too much because she's getting time and a half pay for 72 hours. Is that math? No. Yeah, 72 hours. <laughs> I had to check my math. Uh, but still, it, it, he's treating her pretty awfully, which says something because she still is really kind to him in this episode. And then before we leave Utica, we get, um, well, first of all, Karen shuts the presentation down and says, okay, can I see you in my office? Um, this is done. I think I'll just abbreviate this and send it out in an email. And then Pam and Karen get to talking and Pam is making pleasantries. How far along are you? T tell me about your husband. And then Karen asks about Scranton and asks about Jim. And Pam says, we're engaged. And Karen is so awesome. She's genuinely really, really happy that Jim and Pam are happy and engaged. And Pam, as they're leaving, says, I'm, I'm really glad I came because I'll never wonder again if, if I did something wrong. Now she, now she has closure, she says, which is a really, really lovely sentiment. And it's, it is closure for kind of that part of Jim's life in Pam's head. And so Michael, of course, gets the idea about Holly. And he never really did get closure with Holly. He dropped her off in Nashua, and that was it. They've never talked since. So Pam... It doesn't matter to her. It's it's time and a half either way, whether whether they do the presentation where they were supposed to or not. And they go to Nashua instead. They do. And that's so cool of Pam. He says, you know, I need closure, too. You just got closure with Karen. I need closure for this part of my life. He says uh, she was the love of my life a hundred times what you and Jim have, which I think that says a lot about his opinion for Holly, because, I mean, he's been very supportive of Jim and Pam. So. She doesn't hesitate. She just says, well, let's go. Let's do it. Even though Nashville wasn't on the stop. And she suggests throwing off their presentation at Rochester, I think, in order to go to Nashua instead. It's very cool of Pam to agree with Michael and to, at the drop of a hat, turn around and go that way for him, specifically for him. Uh, if only Nashua went better. As soon as they get there, they find out that Holly is dating somebody else at the branch named AJ, and she's not there. She's on an HR, Human Resources, retreat. And uh, by the way, Toby's not there, so I don't know if it just didn't include him or he wasn't invited, but whatever. She's gone, <laughs> and AJ's there, and Michael is falling apart. <laughs> he at first says, I cannot do it. I can't do the presentation. I'm going to completely just not be able to get through it. And Pam kind of talks him into it. She says, you know what? If you do a great job, everyone will be talking about it when she gets back and she'll miss you. She'll realize that you were here and that she wants to be with you. And so Michael decides to go ahead and try the, the presentation. And sure enough, he spends the whole time falling apart, quizzing AJ, asking him off topic, inappropriate questions about his relationship with Holly. And he can't do it. He physically crawls out of the office halfway through his presentation, and uh, Pam is left finishing his presentation. That was weird, huh? <laughs> <laughs> she tries to make it. She's like, wow, this is all part of the presentation. <laughs> I'm trying to bridge the gap between what just happened and the fact that I'll be giving the rest of the presentation. <laughs> And Pam reading Michael's cue cards is just awful. I, I think they're bad enough coming out of Michael's mouth, but for her to try and imitate Michael's style uh, and make his references, it, it, it's just painful. That, that whole scene is painful. People talk about the cringe of the office. That's one of the scenes. They don't make any sense when Michael's doing it, but at least he it's, it's his writing and it's in his head. And so he can just commit to it and look crazy. Pam sort of knows where he's going because she, she's seen this enough times at the different presentations but she's just kind of oh and oh i have a chance oh, have a chance. right <laughs> <laughs> cutting down the competition you know yeah. and she's just kind of trying to remember what parts went where and it's all very botched 
Michael has his own little mini reunion with Holly when he visits her desk. Of course, she's not there, but he snips off a sleeve of her cardigan that's laying on the chair. Uh, Okay, that's not creepy. Which I have thought. Like, (laughs) if he really needed it, he could have just taken the cardigan and she probably wouldn't have noticed. Or the chances of her noticing were way slimmer than if she came back to a cardigan with a missing sleeve. (laughs) It's true. She's going to know that. Right. (laughs) Um, And then he looks at her computer and... uh, the, the background, by the way, is of a character by Martin Short, uh, and Michael Snickers at it. And his, the character's name is Ed Grimley, I think I found out. Mm-hmm. And then From SNL. Yeah, yeah. And then he sees a document that is titled Dear Michael, and he takes out his flash drive and takes the document. Yeah. Oh, bad. Really, really not cool. It, it, it looked like he kind of just bumped the desk or something and her computer woke mm-hmm. up. So that's innocent enough. He laughed at the screensaver, kind of made him love her even more because presumably he loves this character as well. And then he sees the file. And at that point, just back away. Don't look. Don't read it. Don't open it. Don't do anything. But he takes it. And um, that is a big enough violation of trust. But he wants to read it. And Pam convinces him not to. Pam says that would be a huge violation of trust. You cannot read that. She never sent it to you. That's not a letter you need to be reading, but I can read it, yeah. which it was, I want to know what you think about that. I mean, clearly the morality is a little, a little fuzzy, right? <laughs> but thoughts. I don't know. I, I don't think it's right for either of them to read it, but Pam does have a point when I, I guess one of the camera people gives her a stare and she says, what? I'm not in love with her. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter yeah. if I violate her trust because really it's not her trust in me that that letter to I don't know where I was going with that. She she doesn't have trust yeah. in me necessarily. She has trust in Michael because they are the ones that had the relationship. And my question does stem from do you think she tells Michael the truth in regards to what the letter actually contains? I think she does only because I think we know Pam well enough at this point that there's no point in lying and Michael came for closure. Mm-hmm. And had she said, like, look, she loves AJ, this is it. He came looking for closure, so I think he would accept closure at that Mm -hmm. point. Um, But he didn't get closure. He got the opposite. I mean, it's wide open. So I think he came expecting for it to end, and then it didn't. But he didn't react either way like it was ending. You know, when he met AJ, which is closure, I mean, that is, she has moved on. Mm -hmm. He didn't take that well. So it's... But for Pam, there's really no reason for her to lie, so I don't think she would. Right, I I wouldn't think she would either, but we have seen instances of her telling Michael what he wants to hear, uh, Mm -hmm. thinking back to, is it called Performance Review, Uh, back in like season two or three? Yeah, season two, there's Performance Review, Mm -hmm. um, when that's right after uh, the client, when they make the sale at Chili's with Jan, and they kiss, and he's analyzing the voicemail and all that. Um, and there've been other instances, but I think I agree with you here that this is a big thing to lie about if she's just telling Michael what he wants to hear. So Mm -hmm. who knows, but it's a good moment. And I mean, I think it just really shows that Michael cares a lot about Holly. And uh, at this point, who knows if we'll see her again, but he hopes to have a future with her. We should clarify, I guess we didn't, that. Once Pam reads the letter, she says, it's not over. Right. And that she still has feelings so, for him. Right. So that, that's what Pam says was the content of the letter. So, TBD. Going back to another storyline, we have Jim and Dwight, who, again, have upset Kelly. The first time was when they didn't go to her, uh, what's the show? America's Got Talent. Yeah, they didn't go to her America's Got Talent watching party. So uh, they didn't get the mugs, and she was really upset with them. And so now they've done it again. They have been put in charge of the party planning committee since there was the whole conflict between Phyllis and Angela regarding blackmail and other things that aren't conducive to a positive working relationship. So Michael has placed both of them in charge. Great idea, considering their rivalry. And neither of them are really happy about it, but they, they forgot Kelly's birthday. and. 
there's all these little things like Jim doesn't remember how to spell her name correctly. Is there an E between the L and the Y or not? How old is she? What's the theme? They're, they're just struggling in all kinds of ways to put this party together. And it literally takes them all day to come up with something even remotely passable. It is very upsetting to Kelly. And she says, you know, I'm so glad it happened to me because I at least can handle it. But my one wish is that this would never happen to anyone else ever. And of course, she's being really dramatic. And Kelly dramatic? No way. Never. Never. <laughs> but uh, Jim and Dwight really are trying to make this right. Especially Jim. I think he's just, okay, let's, let's give her a party. Let's make it right. She'll move on. And so they ask her what kind of cake she wants. She says ice cream. They get it. And they thought that was all that it took. <laughs> he says, we got you a cake. And she says, oh, I want to see the cake. And so Jim brings her to the freezer, shows her the ice cream cake, and it is a blank white cake. And she hates it. Where's the theme? There's no writing on it. It, it just, they're just not, they're doing the very minimal mm-hmm. party. <laughs> um, and so... Okay, frosting and birthday aren't themes, so we have to come up with a theme. (laughs) Um, Dwight tries to decorate the conference room, which is possibly my my favorite thing of these two episodes um, as far as the the comedy side. And a constant birthday theme for Office fans ever since. (laughs) Yes, yes. In fact, um, thanks to one of our listeners, Abel, I got a uh, It Is Your Birthday (laughs) gif over the the weekend so that was uh (laughs) of course office related dwight does the brown gray and black balloons and we learn that dwight can't really blow up balloons past you know when you blow it up and it's that initial one and then you have to really purse and they get bigger well he can only do it to like the point where they don't stretch um if that makes any sense so they're all itty bitty they fit in the palm of the hand and dwight just tapes them on the ceiling tapes them on the door they're just everywhere and they look horrible um he got them because they match the carpet that's not (laughs) it's not what you're going for it is your birthday period is the sign that they put up on the wall no food really it's all just very bad there are a couple of interesting dwight things in this episode the first is he actually defends jim at the beginning when kelly comes in and says screw you uh he says that is no way to address a superior so I guess he he just has trouble acknowledging Jim as his superior, but he recognizes Jim as in charge of everyone else. So that was the first moment. Right. And then the second is that it appears that he's actually trying to make amends with Kelly. Like he's not just doing it to do it, I don't think. He seems to be trying pretty hard because if he wasn't, he wouldn't have the whole, are you trying to hurt my feelings? Because if so, you are succeeding. Quote, you know, Jim says, you know, this looks awful. This is terrible the balloons fit in the palm of my hand and he he says it it hurts his feelings so i i guess that dwight is actually trying to do a good job with this we see him later in the episode uh i think it's part two at this point he makes a as jim calls it very effeminate poster (laughs) announcing the time of the party so it's maybe I i don't know what would spur this but dwight seems to be actually trying to please kelly at this point They do end up finally coming up with a theme, and it's kind of brilliant. It's a choose-your-own theme, so they put a chiclet on the cake (laughs) that is misspelled. They do put some, they say, happy birthday, Kelly, with an E. It's without an E. Um, And there's a chiclet right in the middle, and Kelly says, why is there a chiclet on my cake? And Jim and Dwight are both so excited. They're like, no, 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 this is good. It's good. It's a choose-your-own theme party. You can either choose an hour of TV or an hour nap. And she chooses the nap, which is what I would choose. And um, she's so excited. She loves it. So they kick everyone out of the party. They give her a pillow and a blanket and throw it under the desk and she gets an hour (laughs) nap. Yeah. So it turns out fine. Kelly loves it. She she says, I'm too excited to sleep. And um, it ends up a, a good party. Well, it ends up a good gift. <laughs> right. There, there was a tiny moment uh, when, well, first they point out how hard it is to nail down Kelly's age, which I, yeah, it is kind of hard to nail down exactly how old Kelly or even Mindy Kaling is. I looked up at the time of this uh, episode, she would have been around 30. And I think the character is supposed mm-hmm. to be around the same age. It says, uh, well, leading into Dwight saying that she spent 95 and 96 at juvenile detention center for, as they find out, stealing her boyfriend's dad's boat as retaliation for him breaking up with her. 
And so that would have made her birthday. She was 14 around 1981 or so. So yeah, about Mm -hmm. 28 to 30 window, but it's not something I'd really considered before. (laughs) Dwight guesses 24. No, 37. (laughs) There's a pretty (laughs) wide range that they suspect for her birthday, for her age, I I should say. Which leads into Andy. This is a part one storyline. And he is, according to him at least, having a hard time dealing with the breakup for with Angela, which is understandable. He says it's a fight between the Nard Dog and crippling despair, loneliness, and depression. <laughs> which that, those are pretty heavy things, and I I yeah. feel for him, but he's more than a bit on the obnoxious side in this episode. He he literally goes straight up Michael Scott in this episode, you know. He really does. Um, Stanley has brought in a client named Julia, and Andy is completely smitten. He really, really likes her, although he really has barely met her. And he's mad at Stanley for not introducing them, for not even not introducing them, for not setting them up. He says, we're friends, and you totally let me down. <laughs> Stanley's like, we're not friends. <laughs> no, we are. We're friends. I can't believe you, you didn't let us meet. And Stanley says that he would give Andy Julia in exchange for two of Andy's clients, which is creepy, but they agree on it. So (laughs) Stanley releases Julia into Andy's care as his client. And she's totally freaked out by Andy, totally justifiably, because he is not even talking business. He is talking about, I mean, he, he looked in her car and found the kind of CDs that she listens to and quotes that at her hoping that that'll be a conversation starter he instead of being straightforward says hey should i send this to your boyfriend or what does your boyfriend think of your massive success oh. kind of making her say i don't have a boyfriend it's just really ugh, it's really gross and skeevy and then of course at the end um he walks julia to her car he tells her that as a new client she'll always be taken care of that's the nard dog guarantee she says what's a nard dog and he says, this is the Nard Dog. And he leans in to kiss her. She, of course, backs up and says, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? And they kind of briefly talk about the fact that they have both just broken up with people and how hard it is. He asks her out and says, hey, do you want to go to the mall and talk about it? And she says no. And then as she drives away, there's a talking head with Andy. And he just he's nodding and he goes, we lost the account. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm he's sure. like one of those creepos who go to restaurants and ask out waitresses just because the waitress is nice of them. You know, yeah. like it, it's real creepy. Yep. Uh, of course, you know. <laughs> um, oh. it, it's funny that he appeals to Stanley for his friendship, and Stanley sort of rebuffs him because he did this. Stanley did the same thing back in Conflict Resolution in season two with Phyllis when she said, "What we're close," and he says, "Yeah, we sit close." <laughs> <laughs> um, and then. Andy trying to uh, handle Julie as a client reminds me a bit of Ryan in Traveling Salesman because uh, when Stanley walks in and says, hey, Julia, Andy's going to be taking over, he says, give my best to your mother. So that that implies that he has some sort of history with Julia because he knows her at least well enough to know where her mother, whether she's in the mm-hmm. business too or some other method of contact i don't know but in traveling salesman ryan begged stanley for the sales pitch and they show up and it's a group of black men who obviously have known stanley for a long time and ryan's doomed at that point too so uh i think stanley knows how to manipulate people a little bit just to get a laugh maybe to get a couple clients in this case yeah it's it's creepy it's it's not andy's best (laughs) let's put it that way i guess And then in part two, there's a small storyline that is, um, again, super cringy. (laughs) There's an Angela. I mean, it's it's sort of a C story at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, But she has sold Andy's engagement ring rather than giving it back to him, which, first of all, you are the reason that you're no longer with Andy. You had an affair. You give back the ring. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I think you should give it back no matter what. But you're the reason. You don't get to sell the ring. So she sold the ring and bought a $7,000 cat with the money, um, which, you know, they give out free cats. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> oh, but this is a third ger- generation show cat. Her dad yeah. was on Meet the Parents. It's a big deal, yeah. Katie. Big deal. She's very <laughs> excited. Um, 
And she has her cats on nanny cam uh, just to keep an eye on them and this new one, Princess Lady, which is the most obnoxious <laughs> name in the world. Um, and she says that Princess Lady means more to her than any cat or any person. Uh, and of course, all the onlookers are just freaked out because she's such a crazy cat person. The nanny cam shows one cat um, doing naughty things, getting, doing things <laughs> with Princess Lady. <laughs> And Angela, of course, freaks out and runs home to stop it. But she doesn't realize she leaves the nanny cam on her computer volume high. So Kevin and Oscar hear and see things that they wish they hadn't, (laughs) including Angela licking Princess Lady and hissing at the other cats. And upon her return to the office, she says, oh, was this on the whole time? And they said, oh, I don't know. And she coughs up a hairball while sitting at her desk. So she is the stereotype of the crazy cat lady. She is. Um, and it is gross. Yeah. And I, I don't think we need to talk about it anymore. That's, that's, all, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, any other character moments? I think we basically covered all three of our storylines here. Or four yeah, at this point. Fun. Yeah. Uh, funny moments. What do you have? Of course, the cold open, uh, which we get for part one, not for part two. Michael is introduced to the PA system on the phone. Jim says, this morning, the phone guy comes in and he shows Michael (laughs) that the phones have a PA function. And then he just left. He just left. (laughs) (laughs) He just left us there with that information. So Michael, (laughs) over the course of the cold open, he becomes a boat or a plane captain. I forget. The ghost of salesman past, a sports announcer has a coughing attack over the PA and makes a personal medical phone call over the PA. He also calls Toby to the principal's office because he wet the bed. Yeah. Uh, Jim has enough of it and <laughs> comes inside with the pair of scissors and finds an excuse to kneel and snips Michael's phone line, leaving him none the wiser that nobody else can hear him anymore <laughs> from his office. So uh, that's the end of that. <laughs> Jim just goes, oh, did I, did I leave my, is it? Hmm, he just kneels and, Snip. what are you looking for? Oh, it's not in here, never mind. <laughs> just gets it. Uh, Michael brought a toboggan sled on his trip because you never know when you're going to find a snowy hill. I guess not, but you're also a grown man in his 40s. <laughs> and with a snowy hill, you can watch the kids go down the hill on their toboggan sled. You don't need to do it yourself unless you have a kid with you. And you also don't need to bring it on your business, business trip, trip as well. Yeah, that, that's a big part of it too. <laughs> Also on the business trip, Michael and Pam um, are explaining to the camera crew what they're doing. Michael says, okay, so what we do is we drive all day and we stay in hotels together at night. Pam says, separate rooms. Michael, well, that goes without saying. I'm going to say it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Just to be safe. And in the closing moments of the episode, he says, you know, I feel good about finally having closure with Holly. We should go apologize to Roy. Pam says, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. And then he says, well... What about that? the fat guy from Stanford I insulted? <laughs> the fat guy from Stanford I insulted. Yeah, uh, it's Tony, or Pepperoni Tony, as Michael remembers him. And then he says, you know, I know myself, I would not be able to apologize when I was in front of him. He is too fat. And he just talks about Tony being fat for the next 30 seconds. It's pretty bad. Which makes me think that Michael really does use these mnemonic devices and that they work for him. Yeah. But... He didn't work right away because he didn't remember right. Tony's name. Yeah, he starts with Job of a Hut, which that, that's right. the most insulting thing. <laughs> yeah, I love this one. And this one always got by me. But again, in the name of the podcast, I look things up now. Um, Creed gives Andy advice on asking out Julia. He says, this is how I got Squeaky From. <laughs> now, Squeaky From, or her name, Lynette, is a would-be assassin. She tried to assassinate uh, President Ford and was incarcerated for 30-something years before being released on parole. So Creed um, dated or slept with a would-be assassin? Uh, I I believe uh, it, but that's crazy. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I looked that up too, and so I had that information ready to go. She was actually just released later the year this podcast, or this Mm -hmm. uh, episode premiered, so in 2009. uh, about six months later. And, you know, yeah. it's funny, Creed at the end of this says, have I ever steered you wrong, Jim? And this is him talking to Andy, so maybe? Andy's like, what? what? Wait a second, huh? <laughs> maybe, yeah. Uh, and another, the other Creed moment I had written down was, uh, it comes at the end of part two, Jim asks Creed for money for the party, 
And Creed says, oh, yes, I want to contribute. He pulls out his wallet, gives Jim a bill, and it's a $3 bill, which have never existed. There's the, the nope. $2 bill that has occasionally existed, but the $3, nope, not a thing. And it definitely doesn't have George W. Bush's face on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jim asks Dwight in the midst of all this party planning if there was a birthday that Dwight particularly liked. Dwight describes his birth in gross detail. Yeah, I, I don't think you remember that, Dwight. Nice try, no. but no. Jim says, forever stop that story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Never again. <laughs> the quote earlier I mentioned where Dwight says, are you trying to hurt my feelings? If so, you have succeeded. The The end of that is, Fortunately, my feelings regenerate at twice the speed of a normal man's. <laughs> <laughs> Dwight's idea of the perfect party, as they're going into this, involves beer, fights to the death, cupcakes, blood pudding, and horse hunting. But he says, never mind, horse hunting, that's stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> that's dumb. I mentioned the poster that he made earlier. While Jim is, make, Jim is doing more important things, and Jim says, you know, we could have just announced this to the office. You could have been helping me this whole time. And so he does announce it to the office. Hey, everybody, the party's now at 3 p.m. Stanley says, I know. I just read it on the sign. <laughs> and Jim's just frustrated. I, I know, but that's not the point I'm trying to make here. <laughs> I mentioned it a bit how happy Angela was, but really creepy seeing her happy she smiles so much and she's like giddy about this cat and it just seems like this is her one thing in life now and she's just so she has to be happy about this um i put it under funny moments but it's mostly creepy yeah it is mostly creepy she uh, at that point <laughs> kevin is double fisting a popsicle and a drumstick ice cream and she walks mm. in and goes oh kevin ice cream nice that looks good Looks Whereas <laughs> any other time of day when she's not this happy, it would have been criticizing Ke uh, Kevin, just like Oscar did just a few moments before. Right. Uh, Jim tells Dwight about the time he went to the Natural History Museum in New York City with his dad for his birthday. Uh, they looked at fossils all day, and at the end he got a plastic triceratops, and he says it was awesome. Dwight says, that's cool. Hey, you know what's even cooler than a triceratops? Every other dinosaur that ever existed. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to put down his experiences just a little bit? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. That might be it for me, except that I just want to say how much I love Jim and Dwight as head of the party planning committee. Um, we don't get much more or any more, I don't think, uh, without giving anything away. But it's really good. And I, I love this episode for them. I, yeah, I love them being first to, forced to work together yeah. aside from just sitting next to each other. Just a couple more for me. Kelly uh, at one point says, you know, I think sometimes people are really mean to the hot popular girl. Not usually, but uh, you're welcome to think that <laughs> if it makes you feel better. She's also not that popular at the office. <laughs> no. And then one more thing. Meredith, this isn't a funny thing. It's just a sort of tidbit. Meredith claims to have had her second kid just for the vacation. Because uh, at this point, Angela said they don't recognize cat maternity. Uh, oh, but if you, if you have a, a human kid, you get a whole year off. Uh, she's just poking fun at things, even though she's being ridiculous. And Meredith says, I had my second kid just for the vacation. So that leads into me pointing out that Jake isn't her only kid. Uh, we met Jake back in Take Your Daughter to Work Day. And that led to a little bit more digging because I c didn't remember any details about her second child. But it was revealed in the Accountants web series, which we did talk about back in season two. When she says she has a daughter named Wendy, who is, quote, the good one, and her ex-husband has custody of her. So there's that detail that I didn't remember, but now it's out there. Meredith does have two kids. There's Jake, who we've seen, and Wendy, who we have not. Does it say who's older? Who the I don't know. Is? Yeah. I, I don't know. I'll be curious I would assume Wendy, up. but I, I don't know for sure. I feel like it would be Jake as a second kid, only because we've seen Jake. And after having mm. Jake as a first kid, I don't think you'd want a second kid. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that's a good point. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> okay. What about deleted scenes? I really only have a couple. There's one from part one. Jim has a talking head where he is so thankful to Pam for going off and, and earning money uh, time and a half on her um, lecture circuit with Michael. He says, I love her so much. 
He says sometimes he'll wake up and look at her sleeping in the soft light of morning and drag a shoelace across her face and yell, Pam, wake up, there's a bug on your face. And she'll wake up <laughs> screaming. <laughs> and it was just so romantic. <laughs> yeah, it's a great example of failed expectations being a good comedy. Yeah. You know, a, a good joke. Like we, we think he's going one way and then he just takes it a whole other way. <laughs> Angela hands over all of her party planning committee materials, including minutes from past parties, birthdays, half birthdays, and an enemies list, which she says they're going to need. Okay. And she wishes them luck. Then Jim and Dwight offer her a spot on the committee. <laughs> like, we desperately want to be out of this. So would you, would you like a spot on the committee? And Dwight says, you can run it and take care of everything. And we wouldn't get in your way. And she says, nope, it's your problem now. And Phyllis snickers in the background, and Jim says, run it? You really went all in there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> she thrives on power. <laughs> right. <laughs> we see some scenes where Andy hits on Julia Moore, and then we see him black out the McCain Palin 2008 sticker on his car. Uh, presumably, Julia is a Democrat, and <laughs> Andy doesn't want um, her to see his McCain sticker. That, that was real weird. Uh, but the, oh, he, he at following that, he says, you know, people do crazy things when they're in love. And I'm a person. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and, and one of those scenes was him actually learning Julia's name. We didn't see that in the episode. Uh, he interrupts Stanley's meeting the first time before bringing in the coffee. Uh, he's looking for saffron for his paella. Because those are things that you totally just make in the middle of the office. Yeah. I guess. It's strange. And then she tells him, oh, my name is Julia, because that's one of my favorite names. Robert's child, Louis Dreyfus. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. There's one, it's in part two, or it would have been in part two with Angela. And it's not, there's not a whole lot. It's It's just a little talking head with her. But there's one line that cracked me up. She said, so as you may know, I'm no longer in a relationships. Plural. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's like she considers them one entity. It was excellent and yeah. horrible. <laughs> I texted you as soon as yeah. I watched this deleted scene earlier, and I said, you know, I, I screamed at this guy, and I, I really did. I was like, come on, this is ridiculous. Because <laughs> that whole storyline just makes me mad. Yeah. Not not at the writers, but at Angela. Right, and of course. a little bit at Dwight. It's, it's ridiculous. Apparently, the Finer Things Club is still going on, which is pretty cool. Uh, but it's only Toby and Oscar because Pam is gone. They're discussing a book called The Rape of Nanking. And Toby is a little bit too apathetic towards the plight of the people in the book for Oscar's tastes. And then Jim and Dwight walk in asking Toby, you know, you and Kelly are good friends, right? He says, well, I, I sit next to her. And he, uh, Jim asks, well, what, what do you think she would like for her birthday party? And Toby says, you guys are still working on this? Yikes. And Oscar, frustrated with Toby still, says, oh, 200,000 dead Chinese gets a meh, but a birthday party gets a yikes. And then uh, the as Jim and Dwight are walking out, Dwight walks over and picks up the book and says, oh, I love, 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 love this book, which is disturbing and telling because this book is about a real life event that happened back in 1938, I believe. And uh, so that like at the very beginning of the World War Two, uh, and it's about the Japanese army's massacre and rape of up to 300,000 Chinese civilians during the Second Sino-Japanese War. So Dwight, once again, revealing sort of what side he was on with World yeah. War Two. Yeah, lots of yeah. World War Two uh, Dwight references. Oh, and this also reminded me of a tidbit that doesn't relate to this episode. But I saw it like in a video recently or something, and I was sad we didn't mention it. Hmm. In Branch Wars, when we first met the Finer Things Club, the teapot that they're using is the teapot that Jim gave to Pam in Christmas Party in oh. season two. Was it really? I'm pretty sure. I didn't even. And so, yeah, catch that. didn't I occur to that. me. Ah. Yeah. There you go. Last deleted scene I have, um, Kevin recorded the video of Angela licking her cat on his phone for a rainy day. And apparently that rainy yeah. day is today because he watches it like three times <laughs> right. and just laughs. Uh, going into our discussion topic, it's more of a game because 
we thought, you know, we haven't done a game on this show in a while, so this will be fun. This is actually borrowed from another podcast I listened to called Hashtag Millennial, but the hashtag is silent. Um, and they call it Google That Stuff. Stuff. Except they use a we different word for stuff. We don't cuss on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're going to call it Google That Thing, or I think you called it Autocomplete, the Office Edition. That works too. And the premise is we present the first part of a question related to the office as a Google search. And then the other person has to guess the top autocomplete suggestions from Google. So I think we each have three questions that mm-hmm. we've Googled and have answers for. Um, and we're going to eliminate answers that potentially spoil things for the future. So my first question for you, Katie, is finish the sentence. When does Jim Halpert blank? I'm going to say propose. That is on there. Yes. Okay. Any other guesses? One or two more? When does Jim Halpert marry? When does Jim Halpert leave, maybe, if someone thinks he's going to leave? Okay. When does Jim Halpert leave the office Uh is number five on the list. Okay. Okay. The first two are actually pretty much the same thing. When does Jim Halpert come back? And the second one is come back to Scranton. Huh, okay. Number three is propose. Mm-hmm. Number four is get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I and then number so. five, yeah, and number five is leave the office. Okay. Okay. My first one is also Jim related. What is Jim Halpert? What is Jim Halpert? Um, ooh, what is Jim Halpert? This one's tough. So this is tough. Yeah. Um, it, it's more like general office questions. Okay, uh, so what is it? What is Jim Halpert? Mm-hmm. Okay, what is Jim Halpert engaged to? No, married to. <laughs> um, it's more like things. This is this might have been a bad one to pick, but there were so few that I, I was kind of surprised. It's it's more like things that the office might not have told you, so you Google out of curiosity. Oh, okay. If that makes what sense. What is Jim Halpert's middle name? Uh huh. That's, That's on there. I think that was the first one. What is Jim Halpert? Mm, I think there are only. What, four. what is Jim Halpert's job? Close. Close. Mm, one more. One more guess for any of them. One more guess. Let's see. What is Jim Halpert's <laughs> um, actor? Okay. So the first one was, what is Jim Halpert's real name? Oh, sort uh, of with, actor, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, right. Actor, yeah. Mm. The second one, I, I misspoke. The second one was middle name. The third one was mm-hmm. salary. Fourth oh. one is married to in real life. It always mm-hmm. makes me laugh when people are like, when they call the actor by the character name, like, yeah. <laughs> he has a name. <laughs> and the last one was kind of silly. What is Jim Halpert's zodiac sign? Nope. Okay. Because I would never have thought to ask that. No, I don't know if I really even care that I don't much. really care. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my second question. Why Dwight Schrute? Why Dwight Schrute? Yeah. <laughs> I assume there's a does grammatically in there as well, um, but Google doesn't like to do that. Why, why Dwight Schrute beat farmer? <laughs> no. No. Why Dwight Schrute... Am I correct? Is is this like a why does Dwight Schrute? It's why Dwight Schrute. There is one of them that is why did Dwight Schrute. Okay. This one's tough. Why why did... I'm going to go for the did first. Why mm-hmm. did Dwight Schrute... Um, no. Okay. Why Dwight <laughs> Schrute likes Battlestar Galactica? I don't know. <laughs> no. Likes bears? Oh, this one's hard. Yeah, this one is tricky. Um, the first is why Dwight Schrute is the worst. <laughs> oh, okay. The second I got it. is why Dwight Schrute is the best. <laughs> People okay. are all over the place. Yeah. Uh, third is why Dwight Schrute is the best character. Okay. And then the, the did one. Why did Dwight Schrute quit? Okay. Yeah. I like. I couldn't wrap my head around <laughs> grammatically why Dwight Schrute would work, but it. I yeah. Got, we got there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this one actually only has two answers that Google provided, but I, I liked it. So why okay. why is Pam Beasley? <laughs> why is Pam Beasley? 
Which is its own question. <laughs> why? Why? Why is Pam Beasley? <laughs> why is Pam Beasley shy? Mm-mm. Why is Pam Beasley so attractive? We'll give it that. It actually was, why is Pam Beasley so hot? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, see, I was trying to get into the mindset of a Google searcher, yeah. and I got there. You got there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> One more guess, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, why is Pam Beasley so quiet? Why is Pam Beasley banned from Chili's? <laughs> I, I like oh, both, of, both of those answers, so I had to put that one up there. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Okay, lastly, and I'm eliminating a few answers because spoilers, Mm -hmm. but uh, how did Michael Scott blank? How did Michael Scott... (laughs) My first thought, and this is because I feel like people... I don't want to give anything away, but like people assume things. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say die. (laughs) That is on there. Is it on there? It's on there. (laughs) (laughs) How did Michael Scott die? (laughs) How It is how, right? Yeah. How does Michael Scott or how did Michael Scott um become manager? That is number is it one. Really? Exactly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> good job. That Ooh, was good. Okay, okay. One more guess just to see. This one actually has a lot of answers. So Yeah. How did Michael I feel proud of that. How did Michael <laughs> Scott um I can't think of any more actually. <laughs> Okay, so number one was become manager. Number four was how did Michael Scott die? Number five, how did Michael Scott grow his hair from season one to two? <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> uh, after that, get his job. Okay. So same thing as become manager. Never get fired. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. Uh, get his hair back. And then lastly, get into improv. And I don't know if they want the real answer, the Michael Scott answer, because they gave us the Michael Scott answer. Well, actually, they gave us both, right? He said a race car driver came up, and I don't remember the whole story, but a race car driver came up to the sidewalk and says, hey, you're the funniest person that I've ever met, or something like that. And if you're not funny, uh, I'm not whatever the actor Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he says, actually, the real way was a flyer. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm wondering if the Google searcher meant Steve Carell and not Michael Scott. I don't know. Maybe so. My last one is who does Michael Scott? And again, I eliminated some for uh, spoilers. But I have four. Who does Michael Scott date? Yep, that's one of them. Mm, Who does Michael Scott? mm, That was the, the easiest option. Yeah. Who does who does Michael Scott sing to? No. The no. rest of these are, are are more tricky. Who does Michael Scott mm, go to Canada with? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I don't know if I have any more. Um who does Michael Scott fire? Oh, yeah. Who does Devin? I, yeah. I think the first one <laughs> was a spoiler. Um and then it was fire. Who does Michael Scott date? Who does Michael Scott hate? Of course, Toby. And in proper uh, Google grammar, who does Michael Scott dressed up as for Halloween? Oh, thank you, Google. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And the answer is lots of people. Yes. Lots of Halloween episodes. Yeah. Well, excellent. That was fun. Yeah, that was a fun game. It's always something I enjoy on that other podcast, and so I thought it would fit well into ours. So maybe we'll try that again sometime. When we can reveal more spoilers. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But for now, that's the end of the official 47th episode of An American Workplace. You can contact us at facebook.com slash workplace pod or at workplace pod on Twitter. If you head over to iTunes, you can rate, review, and or subscribe. We would always appreciate any uh, feedback and you can email feedback and ideas to workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me at ktlady623 on Twitter which is the best place, or at facebook.com slash katie.white. And the best place for me is at chadadada on Twitter, also facebook.com slash chad.hopkins. And you can find my other podcast, Cinescope, where podcasts can be found, and at thecinescopepodcast.com. Show notes and all contact information for this show can be found at workplacepodcast.com. 
If you want a shout out and more of an American Workplace each week, including access to our discussion outline and notes, a logo sticker, bonus episode, and live streams, check us out on our Patreon page and pick the support level that you think is worth it at patreon.com slash workplace pod. And that's all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 47 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 48 for our discussion on the next two episodes of season five, Blood Drive and Golden Ticket. Bye. This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to rewatching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. Hold on, Chad, we're not live. <laughs> oh, we are not live. <laughs> Start broadcast. There we go. There's our blooper for this episode.